just no, let's talk it. about the Koopa deal. And Sax, this is right up your alley. Have you? I haven't paid a lot company? of attention to it, to be honest. Oh, really? The thing you guys asked is like, you know, what signal will Elon's moves at Twitter uh, be for the rest of uh, the tech industry? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest wake up call is to actually PE companies. So if you play this out and you think that Koopa is, you know, explain what Koopa is, please. Koopa is a is a software as a service company that uh, does revenue management, I guess, or expense forecasting or so, some something in the financial Finance. realm. Yeah. I don't particularly know, to be honest. But anyways, this is a company that, you know, was off 70 or 80 percent from the high, like a lot of SaaS companies were when rates started to go up and they got this offer from from Toma Bravo. But here's what's so interesting about this deal. If you think that you know, these guys bought a company, I'm just going to make up a number at 20 times EBITDA, right? And, and you see Elon at Twitter and you think, well, wait, maybe we can't cut 75%, but maybe we can cut 50% headcount and the company can still do well. And, you know, you take half of the expenses out of the business. All of a sudden, you know, if your EBITDA doubles, you're actually buying it at 10 times. So I think the thing that is the, that is the real insight here is twofold. Private equity um, can still put out a lot of private credit to fund these deals. And SaaS companies are perfect because they have huge free cash flow, right? So instead of funding it based on earnings, they can fund it based on ACV and ARR. So private equity will be super active. And two, all these rifts basically show what the efficient frontier is for the number of employees you need to run a company. And if you can cut 50% of the headcount, private equity folks will do that. And so I think Koopa is like the canary in the coal mine. It is the beginning of what I suspect is a tidal wave of PE sponsored deals in tech companies, largely SaaS, but may go into other realms. Yeah, recurring taking, revenue that can go profitable. Taking advantage of these two yeah. things. Tap yeah. the private credit markets and finance it based on ARR and then fire 50% of the team and double earnings capacity. Sachs, your thoughts? So on, on Coupa, I thought the most interesting thing was just the, we, we got a public comp. Well, we got a comp on what private equity is paying for public companies right now. So the deal happened at an $8 billion valuation. That was a 31% premium to the public price. It was 8.4 times next 12 months uh, revenue. And on a trailing basis, it was about uh, 10 point four times the last 12 months revenue. And by the way, all the comments were around how what a rich price Toma Bravo was paying. People generally thought they were paying a premium to the valuation. So by the I way, think Sachs, this, Sachs, it was 77% premium uh, before the rumors came out that this was happening. So it was a pretty okay. big premium. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, Huge. good point. And there was and there was a there was a bidding war with Vista. And so it was a it was a really rich kind of deal that, that got done here. Right. So, so my, my point is that people thought this was a really rich deal, and yet the valuation multiples are so much lower than what private company founders expect. So remember, last year at you know, the peak, founders were thinking 100 times ARR was normal. 100 times. And you, know, you could roughly say you know, ARR is, is roughly equivalent to next 12 months revenue. It's not perfect, but it's roughly the case. So these founders were expecting a valuation uh, multiple 10 times what the public markets are paying and the public more and, and and actually the, the public markets are, are are half of where tomar bravo was in this particular deal so the public markets right now are valuing uh the median SaaS company at about five and a half times and a high growth well, that'd be for like a 20 percent year-over-year growing company and they're valuing the high growth companies at maybe eight times you right. know and tomar bravo did this at 10 times so that gives you a sense of what the ballpark is. And these are companies that are already public. They're at scale. They're doing roughly a billion dollars of ARR. They have already kind of won their category to some degree. Whereas private companies are subscale. They're, you know, typically you're talking about companies with one, five, 10, usually under $20 million of ARR. They are, they're not de-risk. There's still a ton of risk. We've seen many, many SaaS companies fizzle out and plateau at 20 million of ARR, never get to 100 million, never mind a billion. And yet these founders think that they're entitled to, you know, even in this market, 30 to 40 times ARR. No way. I mean, like it's getting to the point now where, you know, maybe it should be 10 times, 20 times, like max 
for, for and that'd be for a company that's growing two and a half, three X year over year. So I still think that like, so I think basically what we're seeing here is even a good scenario, like a coupe acquisition that was done at a premium, like it's still a wake up call to the private markets that the valuations are still completely and utterly out of whack. Yeah. Let me ask you a question, Zach. So this company was growing 45% last year, they're growing 35% this year, and they got this multiple. Why is it not worth a significantly higher multiple if a company's growing two and a half to three X, which is 250%, 300%. Uh, and these guys are only growing 35%. Sure. I mean, it, it, it is. Um, and that's what you're paying a premium for. Yep. But so the so the, the here's the theory of it is that if you can invest in a private company that's say tripling year over year and they can do that for another five years or whatever, yep. then you're, you're paying for uh, that you're paying for that outcome in a couple of years. Right? Yeah, you're paying, basically. Well, think about you're, it. If you're, you're getting you're paying, a discount to the outcome in a couple of years. Well, if you're paying yeah. thirty times today and it triples next year, you're only paying ten times next year, and if it yeah, triples exactly. again, you're only paying three times. So if that keeps going, that's where your arbitrage is. But here's the thing: you have to weigh against that is that. These early stage private companies, many things go wrong yep. and they hit a plateau, they fizzle out or their growth rate starts to the bigger they get, the harder so it is to So they should be it's, priced at a discount, not a premium because there's risk. There's more risk. They're growing faster, but there's more risk. But also it's very hard once you get to a bigger number of ARR, 50, 100 million of ARR, it's extremely difficult to be doubling or tripling year over year. Let me just point one thing out. So I looked at the numbers on Coupa. I think they had about 170 million of stock-based comp expense in the last nine months. So those are employees that are getting $170 million in compensation in the form of shares. So they get those shares, they can then sell those shares and get cash for them. On the public markets. Pay, pay, yes. And then on the public markets and pay their bills. So when a company like this goes private, for those employees to just remain at their baseline comp, that stock-based comp needs to be replaced with something else, or else they're seeing their salaries reduced. So, you know, there's this balancing game when these companies go private in terms of how do you give them the comp that they're earning to keep them engaged in the business? The, the answer versus, is you don't. <laughs> versus, no, but you versus let them, cutting You let the them quit because you want to do a riff anyway. Right. So, I mean, do you, but for the people that stay, right, so, so there's a balance because it's not just, hey, cut the OPEX. You have to cut the OPEX, including stock-based comp. And this company generated about $100 million, sorry, $210 million of free cash flow or operating cash flow in the last 12 months. Yep. So if you, if you take out the stock-based comp, these guys are actually break-even or losing money, roughly. Um, yeah, break-even. So, yeah, yeah and and break-even, roughly. So there's a real question mark on this business and businesses like this that go private, where if you actually cut the OPEX mm -hmm. and you cut the salaries and you cut the headcount, but you have to find new ways to pay people because you've been paying them with stock in the past. How do you kind of bridge that gap? And I think that's probably a little bit of the balance and the art of what All these right. guys do well. Chamath, if I may, can you explain to the audience uh, what a private equity firm's expectation is in terms of return when they buy a company like this? And then Sachs, I saw your tweet that you want to feature and you'll go next. Go ahead, Chamath. Well, I think it's changed over time. And this is what's so powerful about the private equity industry. Um, look, you have to think about what their incentive is because it kind of guides the outcome. Yes. Um, early on, they were very much like venture capitalists. They were out in the you know, edges of risk taking, um, doing all kinds of very difficult, gnarly deals. So if you look back in the history of private equity, you know, these huge, crazy deals like RJR Nabisco or TWA Airlines were the first um, of the industry and they reaped enormous returns. But there was a lot of risk and it required very heavy handed management. Oftentimes, what that meant was firing a lot of people. Over time, private equity has gotten institutionalized and they don't generally feature themselves as a place to get the best necessarily returns, but they are places where you can put enormous amounts of money, where the, the likelihood of loss is extremely zero, and you generate very good rates of return. Now, again, this depends on whether you want to look at IRR or DPI, right? So a lot of people will market IRR, which, you know, I think is kind of like a gameable metric. But you know, those IRRs can be 20 25%. If you look at DPI, which is really how much cash do you get back, you know, private equity firms can generate one and a half to two X of the money you give them 
um, but they do it consistently and they very rarely lose money. So all of that is important into understanding what's going to happen in this cycle. These folks are going to buy a ton of these private software companies. I think that they are going to fire lots of people. I think they are going to make these companies run hyper efficiently and they will make sure that they generate that 1.2 to 1.7 X that has been historical. Very rarely will they lose money in these things. Uh, by the way, that's going to mean that a lot of these other companies will have to reset valuation. So you saw yesterday, checkout.com went from a $40 billion valuation down to 11. You're seeing some companies only go down 10 or 15%. But it's, it's a process, happening. isn't it, Chamath? Isn't this just like what happens in real it's estate the where- the beginning of this process. Yes, because in, in real estate, my understanding, having lived through these boom bust cycles, is the person living in the home still believes their home is worth you know, this incredible valuation. And then the people who want to buy it are like, that doesn't match reality. And then the real estate brokers go back and forth trying to get people to you know go through this messy middle and come to true price discovery. A private company, it's hard to get pr true price discovery until they're on the brink of insolvency, we they don't have the money. We right. Well, we, we just got some data on that, actually. Can we pull, bring this Cooley data Let's in? Let's do it. Yes. Yeah. So Cooley looked at- A law firm guess, in Silicon Valley. Yeah. They're a prominent Silicon Valley law firm. They looked at a thousand deals over the last three quarters of this year. Mm -hmm. And what they saw is that you're, the later the stage, the bigger the valuation correction. So series D rounds went from three and a half billion oh. to 527 million. That's an 85%. Oh. Yeah, that's an 85% drop. Series C went from 502 million to 130 million. Two that's thirds. a 74% drop. <sighs> series B went from 164 to 90. That's a 45% okay. drop. And then series A went from 58 to 45. That's only a 22% drop. There's just less room to compress there. But the point is that Series B, roughly a 50% drop, Series C, roughly a three-quarters drop, and Series D, roughly a um, like say 85%, yeah, one-seventh drop. So I think founders right now, are they're just like a little bit delusional about this money they raised last year. They're still way too anchored on last year's valuation. And if only they would think in terms of this capital they raised last year, in terms of, of its real dilution in terms of what the company is worth now, I think they'd be treating it more more precious. So for yes. example, but so, so, yeah, so for sorry. example, hold on. If it's you like raise, they won the lottery and they, they yes. don't want to they don't realize they won the lottery. I had this conversation right. with the founder. This is the only money they're ever going to see is the bottom line. And they're spending it like they're going to win the lottery every year. So for example, let's say you take works. a company. Yeah. Let's say you take a company that raised 200 million last year at 2 billion. So it was 10% dilution. So in their heads, they're thinking, oh, well, this isn't that expensive. Like 10% dilution is a rounding error. But really, probably the company is worth maybe 400 million now, <laughs> right? Because it's gone down 80%. Yes. This 200 million of your 400 million is half the value of the company. Yes. And you're squandering yeah. it. You're squandering it at a rate of 100 million a year. So you're basically burning up 25% of the value of your company this year and then next That's year. So and then, good. by the way, you're going to be in crisis after that because you're probably it's like a lottery winner buying like a giant super yacht. I had an observation that a lot of the investors that sit on the boards of these companies, they have an incentive to not see those valuations come down too quickly, do they not? And so there is this sort of like interest in, hey, I don't want you to have to go reprice the company or do a down round because then my portfolio gets written down. And then I'm in the middle, everyone's always in the middle of a fundraising cycle with LPs. And then I'm going to have a tough conversation with my LP is about my, my value. So do you not see VCs and investors playing an active role in trying to keep the valuations propped up to some extent, particularly where they have big markups, 100%. either by extending bridge rounds or doing other sorts of, you know, uh, look, n nobody, nobody likes to go through a down round. And that includes founders and existing investors in the company. That being said, we're not talking here about new financing conversations what we're talking about is advice that are ha is happening in board meetings and you know maybe other vcs aren't pushing as hard as we are but you, the advice i'm giving in board meetings is what i'm telling you publicly today which is this is the last money you may be able to raise on attractive terms if at all you need to treat it much more preciously the world has fundamentally changed and by the way we haven't even gotten into what's coming the demand contraction that's coming next year. Explain what demand contract construction is for the audience, please. Thank you. Okay, look, there's going to be three major sources of slowdown for software companies next year. 
Number one, new business is going to dry up. Companies are just going to be spending a lot less money next year because they're all cutting costs. So you should expect your new business to be roughly 50% of what it was. Next year, it'll be 50% of, of what it was last year. That's my rule of thumb for most companies. New business down 50%. Number two, churn is going to be higher. We haven't seen that much logo churn yet, but next year, a lot of companies are going to start going out of business and it's going to happen over the next two years. So you're simply going to see logo churn rates, say among small businesses, go from like a historical norm of 15% to maybe 25 or 30. In other words, your customer, the logo your customer is simply goes not going to exist. poof. Yes. The, that's what and a logo third, means. Yes. yes. And the the actual entity. Source, yes. Logo churn means the entity doesn't exist. Then you've got seat contraction, which is these companies are not hiring as fast. In fact, they're doing layoffs. So they're simply not going to buy as many seats of your software as you need to in the past. For the last decade, we've had a tailwind, an enormous tailwind for software companies of seat expansion, which is every year your existing customers would buy more seats of your product for their new employees. Now they're actually going to have fewer employees or maybe headcount freezes. So they're actually going to be buying oh fewer God. seats. By the way, if you if you take all those three things, the deal of the century mm. was Figma selling to Adobe for twenty yes, billion. Sir. Yes, because sir. if you take those three things, <laughs> I mean, oh my God, they just absolutely top ticked before any of this stuff was known. Totally. So today, Adobe could probably buy this thing for like seven billion instead of twenty billion. So does that mean they try to do a breakup fee and get out of the deal? I don't Is know, but if I, was, if I was Figma, I'd try to close this thing ASAP and get that money. Yeah, out. yeah. Yeah, you're right about that. And, and by the way, what I'm seeing from founders is that they still want to grow 100% plus over the next year. The problem is that the headwinds are going to be intense. So if, if you're flying a plane and the headwinds are extremely intense and you try to maintain your speed, you're going to burn an enormous amount of fuel. You're going to be incredibly Headwind. inefficient. Yeah. It's better to basically just moderate your speed, let the headwinds basically pass. We're going to have major economic headwinds for the next four to six quarters, call it year and a half. It's okay to have a slower growth rate. Preserve your cash. Don't burn up your fuel. Yeah, bunker down. So what I'm, we're trying to Batten do down is give, the we're trying to give permission to our founders to grow at a slower rate because they feel this enormous pressure from their VCs to grow at, at, at insane rates. Can I build on this? I think Freeberg said it very well. The scam in venture capital is demonstrated in the following chart. This is using Cambridge and our friend Brad Gerstner helped put this together. So what is this? This goes back all the way to 1997. And the gray bar is what venture capitalists share with their limited partners as to how well they are doing. What the is top called quartile of venture top, capitalists. And this is the top 25%. Okay. Yes. So this is this is a venture capitalist. And you know, our our returns have been consistently top quartile. So instead of cherry picking anybody else, I'll just use us, but it could be Sequoia, Benchmark, you name it. We would launch, go back to, we're in there. Launch, you would go back to folks, craft, we would go back to folks and say, hey guys, the total value of our portfolio is three times your money in 1997's vintage. Okay. It it was uh, four times your money in the 2010 vintage feels really good. But again, the job of the venture capitalist is to convert the gray bar into the purple bar. And historically, there's been a decay. So for every dollar of gray bar that you show, you typically only get 73 cents actually returned to people. Mm -hmm. Okay. The so paper the value, value the book to, value. Just to be versus, clear, the, yeah. the valuations that you get when you sell your company or goes public end up being 73% of what you marked at the peak, what you said they exactly were worth. Exactly right. Today. Exactly right. And the actual value of this purple bar going back, you know, 30 years is 1.7x. So just to put numerical numbers on this, if you were a venture capitalist, you would raise a $100 fund. At the peak, you would actually show that that $100 became $200 but when, when push came to shove and when it was all said and done, you would return $170 back to your investors. That's the rough equation. So what's the problem? Well, the problem, as you can see in this chart, is right around 2015, which is all of a sudden, you know, what we've started to see are these continually elevated gray bars. Yes, this stuff is worth seven times, six times, five times. 
but we have not seen the purple bars catch up. Now, some people will say, well, yeah, but you have to give it time. And, you know, this is it probably has to what That's other reasonable. vintage look yeah. times. And all you need to do is do what's called a regression. And you need to regress these things to the mean and make the following assumption. Assume for a second that this time is not different. Assume that these historical averages, 2.2x, 1.7x holds. Well, that's what the, the black line here shows. You can calculate the area above the curve as the value at risk, right? The amount of money we will destroy because of all these shenanigans that Freebird just talked about. Propping up marks, not willing to look at actual market clearing prices. Well, if you do the math, the sum of the area above this black line is almost a trillion dollars around the world. And it is about $600 billion dollars for US venture capitalists. This is the dynamic that the private equity industry is gonna prey on. So if you saw Toma Bravo just closed a $32 billion round, you know, Vista's raising a $20 billion round, everybody's stepping into tech, they are going to destroy those gray bars. Would you describe that as bottom feeding? No. No, they the are way. They are the rational actor yeah. okay. who is finding the true market clean the price. Again, I will say price. this. I think the private equity industry is unbelievably precise and talented in being okay. dispassionate and telling us what these things are. They're cutthroat. They're but, logical. But, no, but no, that, it's not that cutthroat. Second, that They're just smart. That opportunity for the private equity industry is going to be created by profligate founders. And look, you could blame VCs for the high marks last year as well. They were profligate too. But look, if you're a founder, if you don't start acting in a more capital efficient way and preserve your cash, your company is ultimately going to be owned by a private equity firm and they're going to make all the money. Well, here's an, because, here's an important, because because hold on, yeah. because when you sell to them at a low price, all you're going to end up doing is paying back the liquidation preference, and then that private equity firm that or was less. willing to do or less, but that private equity firm will be willing to do what you were not willing to do, which was simply act, cut your burn, cut your costs, and act in a more capital efficient way, and they will end up making all the upside for your decade of hard work because you got uh, basically addicted to venture capital and the high valuations and refused to. Again, adjust to the regime change. I agree that with we're that. Describing. I'll, I'll give you I an alternative. I'll give you an alternative. The alternative is that the majority of acquisitions made by private equity firms are not actually pure acquisitions. They're bolt-on acquisitions, meaning that these are companies that are added to existing platforms that they own. So this acquisition they're doing of Coupa, I think it's very likely over the next couple of years, you will see like the playbook in private equity includes not just cost cutting, but also synergy building. And they typically do bolt-ons and add-ons, and this happens across all private equity platform deals, of new products and services that can be sold through the existing sales channel, the existing customer base, um, and as an add-on to the existing service or product that's already offered. So one of, the fe one of the things that I think you may see in Silicon Valley over the next couple of years is a rationalization away from funding feature companies and thinking much more carefully about what can be true standalone product companies. Sure. And many of these companies that have raised a ton of capital um, and have gotten crazy valuations, at the end of the day, they're more likely better equipped to be a feature of another platform than awesome. they are to be a standalone platform company of their own. And that's where the majority of these acquisitions will likely end up going yep. um, in, in, in the private equity landscape. And they will be vacuumed up and attached to existing platforms that these private equity guys are building out. And by the way, just look as an example at what Oracle did over the years, what Salesforce did over the years, what Google did. So many of these companies- Bolt on acquisitions. By bolt on acquisitions, by building yes. a, cha a sales channel, building a platform, and then um, adding on top of that. And I think that's Two. what a lot of these guys are gonna try and mimic. Two critical points. Number one, what about the bottom 75% of VCs? Oy. If you show that chart just for one more second, I just want to remind everybody, that is the absolute cream of the crop VCs. Top this 25%. is the best of the best. These are folks, I mean, again, I'll just say us, Sequoia, Benchmark, we've consistently Launch been craft. top quartile. Thank you. Launch, Craft. These are, these are top Chef quartile kiss. return streams. Thank the Lord. What about the bottom 75%? They're not going to be able to raise funds, man. It's over. They, a lot of these people who raise first-time funds in the last three or four but it's years. Also, it's also the companies no that Sachs said because like, like it's like the, the today is the moment, now is the moment for the sober founder and the sober venture capitalist to yes. sit and say, what is the real valuation? That's what do we need to do to make sure that this company has a chance? Because what Sachs said is so true. Otherwise, all these profit dollars will be made by the private equity firms. We, in order to win today, you're going to have to grind. You're going to have to work 50, 60 hours a week. 
you're going to have to be absolutely embrace the age of austerity. And you're going to have to focus on your customer, your product and your bottom line. The age of excess is over. If you're not working 50, 60, 70 hours a week, you're not going to cut it in Silicon Valley. Also, key second point, profligate, extravagant or wasteful in the use of resources, just so we get the word of the day from David Sachs. That's David Sachs's profligate, word of the day. Yeah. After a, a very powerful bull this weevil. Is, this bull is- Bull weevil? Um, <laughs> that went crazy. Did you see the Tremont? Bull weevil went- yeah, uh, Bull weevil. This bull is, weevil went, uh, went, 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 went viral. Uh, viral. This is, I think, Elon's biggest uh, non-obvious impact in this moment. J. Tao, here's your uh, one answer to your question about what happens to the the, the bottom seventy five percent of venture firms. It's equivalent to what happens with the, you know, kind of. This is the bottom of the top. The slide that I just shared. It's the one we looked at a few weeks ago, and I keep referring to it because it's just such a staggering like demonstration of what people call the power law, which is how you know kind of excess returns accumulate to minority of investments. So uh, just a few investments make up the bulk of value that the you know market cap of 43% of companies that have gone public since 2020 uh, is $750 billion. The market cap of three, the other 300 is only $26 billion. And the cash that went in to the $750 billion is 136. And the cash that went into the 26 is 107. And so the cash that went in to generate that 26 billion, that 107, that's your bottom 50%. And the top 50% put in 136 to make 750. And I think it gets even narrower as you move further up to that top quartile. So, you know, it's just- I can time, tell you what LPs are saying, because I'm- It's a I, hard business to and transition. By the way, this is, this is the companies that went public. So this is yeah. also of the top company, of the top yeah. funds and the top companies that were actually able to IPO. And so it highlights how much of a power law actually plays through. And so the majority of these companies, as you, in Chamath, even in your chart, you show the top quartile, the bottom 75% uh, or the bottom 50%. I've looked at this data as well, uh, of those various vintages are below 1.0, they lose money for their LPs. Oh, consistently. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a cycle. And so what ends up happening is the next generation comes through and LPs, they make a portfolio of bets. And they hope that they make enough bets in the right VCs that their portfolio generates greater than, you know, market returns, greater than, call it 15, 20% target, 15% target. Um, but they're going to expect that the LPs, majority are not. I have an LP report. I'm, I'm out there raising Launch Fund 4 right now. And I moved from like the accredited, the individual are you investors. Are to say that? Oh, yeah, because you're- Yeah, like, I'm on 506C. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm publicly raising it. And I've moved on from individual investors, $45 million in commits after five webinars. Amazing. Now I'm talking to, <laughs> no, it was amazing. It's just 506C is going to change the entire industry. Letting the, the, you know, the masses have some access to this capital and this opportunity, accredited and QBs is going to change the world, I believe. Do you have to do deal with every one, one of them or is it easy to administer? It's incredibly complex because you have yeah. a large number of people and they all want to talk to me. So I did yeah. webinars, five webinars. And it resulted in hundreds of commits, hundreds of commits for $45 million. But you'll be, able to pull, you'll be able to get all those capital commitments drawn down when you need to, like you have to yes. go ping a couple hundred people and get them all yes. to wire money. You, to you need to have you more operations invest. people. And we right. only do one four. Thing, we, we let Jason, them. One thing, ahead, one thing you may want to do yes, is sir. like for, for these smaller slugs is you can pre-wire, you can set up yes. an escrow account where you pre-wire 100% of the capital. Yes. And then you also don't have to, you take it down when you're going to deploy it. So you keep your IRR correct. So we're actually looking into those solutions. I'll talk to you offline. But I, I just did my first two meetings with endowments, et cetera, fund to funds. The entire discussions right now are around um, what is your secondary strategy? How are you getting in earlier, not later? And how are you building a larger position? It is and, and even like some of the QPs who are sophisticated and are, you know, are in over 10 venture funds, the entire discussion, governance of these companies, are you taking board seats or not? How early are you getting in and building a larger position over 10%? And what is your secondary strategy? When are you going to start taking some chips off the table? So the and, and I got to say, if you're an LP who didn't sell into the up market at all, uh, and you're on your first fund, you know, and you had all these great marks, and they're getting they're coming crashing down. They're not going to deal with you. They just have too think, many options of top funds in the quartile. I don't think they've they've started to come down yet. I don't think we know what the top quartile is really going to look like over these last few years. I think that's going to take four or five years to really sort out. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, so I think explain that, why Chamath, just so people understand. Yeah, I understand. Well, I, I think I think that there are lots of valuations um, that have supported huge 
TVPIs, these you know paper gains that have allowed venture funds to raise enormous amounts of incremental capital and new funds. And so they are going to try to wait as long as possible before they're held accountable for that. And the best way to do that is to not change the valuation. And so it will happen slowly. It'll be a trickle of these things. Um, and I think that takes probably four or five years for, for it to really sort itself out. But in the meantime, companies will still need to get financed. Companies will still need to get built. Um, that's why I think like the public markets, I think what SAC says is true, giving us a signal of what these true market clearing prices are will eventually slip into these, you know, series D or E companies because a venture capitalist who has now taken some big write downs in one part of their portfolio, I suspect will now be very open to selling to private equity for another part of their portfolio so that they can return capital. Totally. Totally um, agree. Yeah. It's going to be rough out there. You guys uh, watch White Lotus? Any